All right, Dan, if you want to go ahead and start the introduction, I think we can get started. Okay, great. Well, it's, it's my privilege this morning to uh, introduce uh, our uh, Cancer Center speaker uh, for this week, uh, Professor Ben Hackel uh, from the uh, Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Sciences. Uh, Professor Hackel uh, received early training in chemical engineering at uh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, followed by a PhD in chemical engineering at MIT uh, in 2009, and then postdoctoral uh, studies at Stanford University uh, until 2011. And fortunately for us here at the university, we were able to uh, recruit Professor Hackel here, uh, where he joined the um, uh, Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science as an assistant professor a very highly productive, uh, well-funded research lab, was promoted to associate professor in 2017, um, and has done some really beautiful work on protein engineering uh, for applications in uh, molecular imaging and, and oncology. And so uh, we're uh, fortunate to have uh, Professor Hackel with us this morning, and I'll turn the, the, the podium uh, over. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dan. Appreciate the introduction and uh, the opportunity to share a bit about our work uh, here today. So um, first and foremost, depending upon how time goes, I want to make sure to thank the people who did the work here. So here's one of the pictures of my lab, uh, a lot of hardworking students and postdocs. I um, just want to thank them for, for all the effort they put forward here. So what I'm going to do today is tell you about our work on engineering developable proteins for molecular diagnostics and therapeutics. So I don't think I need to spend too much time motivating the core concept that precision medicine is empowered by molecular targeting agents. These can be proteins, these can be small molecules. And I just highlight uh, a handful of examples here that have uh, done great things for, for patients over the years in a variety of, of cases from monoclonal antibodies uh, to small molecules like Gleevec uh, and others shown here. Really the ability to selectively target uh, cancer and other diseases for that matter is indeed empowered by this precision. And as a result, a multitude of platforms have emerged over the years to enable ligand discovery, be it protein-based or small molecule-based. Um, for example, antibody and other protein-based display methods, such as yeast display shown here, uh, in which the protein of interest is tethered genetically uh, to an agglutinin mating protein on the surface of a yeast cell. And that combines the function of the protein or the phenotype with the gene encoding for that particular protein or the genotype. So you can do very high throughput selections of millions to billions of different protein options uh, to find the one that has the uh, function of interest in this case, binding to the target. And analogs have been used in phage display and ribosome display and other things of that type as well. And in fact, uh, was shared a, pair of the, a part of the Nobel prize a few years ago. Um, that's on the high throughput screening based approach. You can also perform protein based design where you think from a first principles and a heuristic perspective about what particular amino acid sequences will give you the type of performance uh, you would like. And here I'm highlighting a recent study uh, in de novo design of binders to uh, SARS CoV 2. You can also take a more uh, chemical or chemistry approach and do, for example, structure guided screening where you look at the active site and then make modifications from a MedChem perspective to. Uh, improve ligand performance, uh, as well as fragment-based drug discovery uh, as well. So there's a whole, my, my, my point here is there's a whole host of techniques that can be used from the protein to the small molecule uh, realms to enable ligand discovery for this precision medicine. Nevertheless, as powerful as these techniques are and as useful and fruitful as they have been, uh, there are elements that do indeed remain challenging. So for any new particular target or epitope or type of function that you're trying to target, uh, it's not trivial to get to a functional ligand. And so I'm going to focus today on efforts we've made to improve different stages of this process. So I summarize here the protein engineering challenge. And that is if we have some function in mind, for example, binding to a oncology biomarker that we want to use for imaging or as a target that we want to uh, target cells to deliver therapy to, predicting what structure will elicit that function is challenging and predicting what sequence will elicit that structure will elicit that function uh, is doubly challenging. And that's because getting from sequence to structure to function is challenged by the immense conformational space for any given protein sequence that can fold into many different potential structures. And, to, and in, in addition to then calculate what structure that will be and what that higher order structure will be uh, is, is quite daunting. So from a rational design perspective, it can be achieved and has been achieved, uh, but is not uh, in any way trivial. 
And so the other end of the spectrum would be combinatorial experiments where you can try many, many different things experimentally and see what's most functional. That's challenged because there's 20 to the nth possible protein variants if n is the length of the protein sequence. And that uh, sequence landscape, if you will, uh, is very barren. Very, very few protein sequences actually encode for functional things, let alone the function that you want. And that space is quite rugged, where you make a small change to an otherwise functional protein, it can fall off a functional cliff, so to speak. Or you might be one mutation away from a great protein, but not know it, uh, again, because of the ruggedness of that space. Nevertheless, both of these things together uh, have been functional in the protein engineering and protein discovery uh, realms. And so our approach to this uh, in, in my lab is to do discovery via combinatorial libraries, but more to the point, discovery via rational combinatorial libraries, where we merge these two ideas together. Uh, we'll take the combinatorial approach to try many, many different things, where we'll take different amino acids, place them at particular sites in the protein, uh, synthesize those at the genetic level, put them into that yeast display context I was uh, alluding to a few minutes ago, and then screen billions of different compounds of different proteins to find which ones are functional. For example, by taking fluorescent target or magnetic target and seeing which particular protein sequence uh, has binding selectively towards that target. In some cases, the library is good enough that you're done, you have a functional protein. In most cases, it's good, but not good enough. And so you iterate that idea via directed evolution where you modify the protein sequence at the genetic level and iterate until you found something very functional. And that can work very, very effectively, but only if the Ligian uh, library design, excuse me, is effective and the search or selection technique is effective. And so I insert the word rational here because we can be thoughtful about what does this scaffold look like? Where do we make mutations? What mutations do we make uh, to drive this to be a much more functional process? And we can improve the process by how we're selecting for a particular function and particular binding uh, to improve as well. So I'll use today to describe some of the advances that, that we've made uh, with collaborators uh, in this area. Okay. So we'll start here in that if we're going to do combinatorial library selection, we need to have again, an effective library. We can screen billions of molecules here, but you can go over a billion uh, if, if it's not a good library. And so which sites uh, should we make changes to, to optimize evolutionary efficiency? Well, we can take a two, uh, um, suggestion from nature here in that nature's library is basically the immune system, right? It has antibodies that circulate throughout our body uh, looking for um, problematic things to bind to. And I, how it does that is as diversification in these ends the complementarity determining regions of the antibodies. And it doesn't throw up its hand and do random amino acids everywhere, but rather it has a very precise design at different sites uh, in those antibodies of what the distribution of amino acids look like. It biases them towards tyrosines and serines and glycines, but also differentially at different positions. So we asked the question, how could we pick what our design should look like in this synthetic library that we have? And so I'll gloss over uh, a lot of really uh, excellent and hard work by Danny Waldring uh, in the lab showing that he ultimately took different sources of inputs. He did high throughput binding discovery and then sequenced what do uh, the amino acid frequencies look like at different sites in the protein. He did um, calculations of how different mutations would destabilize or stabilize the protein. He looked at natural homologous proteins and used those as a guide to what amino acids to put where. And he also looked at what things tend to be at binding interfaces. And ultimately what that led to, um, along with some additional high throughput screening of what which one of these combinations is most functional was a particular design of site-wise bias diversity where each individual site in the protein had a particular distribution of amino acids and found that when he did that design, it was much, much more functional in terms of finding binders and much, much more stable in terms of how robust those molecules were than if we took a naive based approach instead. So the summary statement here is that site-wise bias diversity, biased on the basis of those mechanisms I said on the previous slide, improved both discovery and stability of the molecule. And so that enables us to identify these two components effectively. Then we have the question of, well, what should that topology look like? Nature uses full antibodies, uh, but is that the ideal scaffold in all cases? And we would assert that it's not ideal in all cases, certainly very functional and there's many highly useful antibodies, but for particular applications, it's not always optimal. For example, smaller proteins have better physiological transport. And so if you want, for example, a rapid imaging for PET scanning, uh, you'll benefit from a smaller protein. And that's work we did a while back showing that this small 10,000 molecular weight fibronectin images much more effectively than a full 150,000 molecular weight antibody. And also useful uh, in terms of being more modular. If you have these small and single domain scaffolds, they can more easily form conjugates, be they radioisotopes, be they protein protein conjugates, and higher order uh, conjugates. In addition, by having unique topologies relative to an antibody, 
you can potentially target epitopes um, or activities that would be more challenging to do than antibodies. So that has motivated us to try to find an additional set of topologies to serve as ligand scaffolds. So what we've done here is looked into the protein data bank for the 100,000 plus various topologies, evaluated them on the basis of different biophysical properties, like the orientation of the binding site, the stability upon mutation, uh, the consistency and you know, shape perspective of the binding site, the accessibility to, to target, et cetera, and scored them on those bases biophysically, and then ultimately identified a handful of them that we thought might be effective. And this is work led by Max Kuzicki and Alex Kolinsky and others in the group. And ultimately found two, two, key thing, two key things, excuse me, one being that uh, indeed this approach does work. We can find functional new topologies. This one we called the GP2 domain. It's a 45 amino acid scaffold with two solvent exposed loops. And we've been able to evolve it from binding to a whole host of different targets uh, summarized here. In addition, this model formalism of uh, trying to think uh, systematically about what would make a scaffold functional or not functional indeed uh, works and that our model does predict scaffold efficacy in terms of its ability to evolve binding to, to new targets. And importantly, we found that developability or the physical robustness, stability, solubility, expressibility of the protein uh, begets evolvability. So the more robust a scaffold is biophysically, the more it's able to be evolved or innovated towards, towards new function. And this has guided us towards future scaffold discovery uh, as well. And so we've taken this lead scaffold, this GP2 domain that I mentioned, and we've applied it uh, in collaboration to a host of different targets and applications. And I'll just briefly highlight some of those here. We engineered bindings towards epidermal growth factor receptor, uh, an important biomarker in multiple different uh, patient, um, uh, patient subsets. Uh, so the ability to differentiate those whose cancers have high EGFR from low EGFR can indeed predict response uh, to various molecular targeted therapies. And so a molecular imaging approach to image EGFR would, would be use, useful in the clinic in that sense. And so we took an engineered GP2, labeled it with uh, a copper 64 radioisotope, and then had a mouse model with EGFR high tumors in one flank and EGFR low expressing tumors in the other, and found that indeed our targeted agent was able to differentiate uh, the high EGFR expressing tumor from the low EGFR expressing tumor. And it wasn't um, just uh, EPR effect, for example, because A, you don't see uptake in the EGFR low tumor, and a non-targeted agent shows no uptake in, in either tumor. And so it truly is molecularly specific. We took that same approach of engineering these GP2 domains and engineered bindings towards PDL1 with potential applications uh, in antagonism and or in diagnostic imaging as, as such here. Uh, still working through the applications there, but just showing here our ability to find selective potent binders towards, towards that target. And then in collaboration with the Doug Yee's, uh team, we've uh, developed antagonists against insulin receptor. And so again, using this GP2 based scaffold, uh, we've made binders towards insulin receptor and showed in collaboration with Doug, that these indeed are antagonistic of uh, growth factor driven um, uh, growth in a tamoxifen resistant MCF7 uh, cell line. And so collectively, this approach to uh, finding an effective ligand scaffold and efficient way to evolve it uh, has been functional in, in, in a variety of applications. What I want to get to next is this idea that targeting precise epitopes and listening biological function um, can be challenging at some point. So if we zoom in here on this overall part of the directed evolution strategy, um, I highlighted a, a few success cases there where we made binders to EGFR and PDL1 and insulin receptor, um, and those were effective cases. But we've also uh, performed campaigns where we make binders towards various uh, targets, but they don't necessarily uh, yield the exact binding site that we want or the biological function that we're interested in. And so this is challenging in some systems. And so, for example, trying to make antagonists of uh, of activity in enzymatic systems has been has been challenging for the field in some cases. So I'm showing here the structure of carbonic anhydrase. And so this is carbonic anhydrase with a small molecule acetazolamide here in the active site. So targeting that active site by relatively flat protein can be can be challenging. In addition, binding it in such a way that yields the desired antagonism has been challenging. Moreover, this is can be tough because carbonic anhydrase has multiple very similar isoforms. So I show here an overlay of CA2, carbonic anhydrase 2, and CA9, and how similar they are structurally uh, with only two differences in the core of the active site here. And therefore, many of these small molecule inhibitors that have been made are not very isoform specific, which leads to detrimental side effects um, in, in therapeutics. 
And so the field has acknowledged this challenge and has proposed multiple different pathways forward. And I just want to highlight some of those here to show the work that has come before us. One approach is unique protein modifications. So for example, taking the relatively flat antibody surface uh, and modifying it, for example, uh, many cow antibodies have very, very long um, stretches of their complementary determining region, kind of enabling them to get into crevices or other concave types of, of epitopes of targets. So that's one possible uh, approach, but you might not still have the exact chemistry needed uh, for the activity that you're aiming for. So other people have put together peptides and small molecules as conjugates. And I highlight a few of those uh, very nice pieces of work here. Elena Shepard's lab uh, took a small peptide and then conjugated this pharmacophore to it and was able to target then protein kinase with greater specificity than uh, the peptide or small molecule alone. And similar approaches have been pursued by multiple other groups as well. Um, but still finding these as broadly robust techniques um, has still needs some work. And so our approach uh, to this has been to marry the benefit of proteins um, with a larger surface area relative to peptides and relative to small molecules for that matter to drive affinity and specificity. The genotype phenotype linkage that I alluded to before enabling efficient discovery and further evolution of, of lead molecules and their structural organization that limits and trap across the bond binding, all the benefits of proteins. But then the benefits of small molecules, again, their ability to target cavities, broader chemical diversity that we can have in the 20 natural amino acids that we get from proteins and a different type of shape complementarity. So I thought was if we could merge these two ideas together, we might be able to get the best of both worlds and have really strong selective potent targeting. So the concept is to take a protein ligand, uh, such as the GP2s or fibronectins or things that I alluded to before, but then conjugate to it a small molecule so that that could have an integrated binding interface to hit this particular target, for example, the carbonic anhydrase active site. And so you can think of this from the perspective of kind of its own version of fragment-based drug discovery, where our pharmacophore here is that first piece of the fragment, and then we're building upon that with a protein instead of um, a different medchem based approach. Or you can think of this, or and you can think about this as a heterobivalent AND gate, which has been shown very nicely by numerous people in the field that if we can target two targets at the same time and require that both of them bind because of modest affinity for either one, uh, we can reduce off-target uh, targeting uh, and really focus on cells or epitopes or pairs of epitopes that are that are unique to, to the tumor. And so this is kind of a local uh, pair of epitopes where we have the small molecule binding site and the protein binding site adjacent to each other. But synergistically, if we design the molecule right and engineer the molecule right, could enable this to be more selective. You can also think of this from the protein based perspective as being a non canonical amino acid, where we're saying we want to uh, expand the protein repertoire beyond the 20 natural amino acids, something that has been effectively pursued by a host of labs as well, but to do it more, more broadly without the need to completely re engineer the expression system to make a 21st amino acid, we could potentially do this chemically instead. Okay. So from those perspectives, how do we do it? So we take a chemical biology approach where we used to display the protein, in this case, I'm showing a fibronectin domain protein, this 10,000 molecular weight protein. We genetically encode a single file uh, via a cysteine in the binding site of the protein, and then take a malayamide small molecule. So here we're taking the acetazolamide pharmacophore that targets carbonic anhydrase, a PEG linker, to this malayamide, which will selectively react with this thiol on the yeast cell surface to give us this protein small molecule or prism uh, conjugate that we have here. But this is all on the surface of yeast with the gene encoding for the particular fibronectin sequence inside that yeast cell. So we can do this with millions to billions of different protein variations at once. And if we modify which small molecule we put on, we can also modify that portion of the molecule as well. Um, this work is led by Andrew Lewis and, uh, and Abby Hartfone in the group. And they showed that indeed we can functionally conjugate these small molecules to the protein on the yeast cell surface. Not only are they chemically conjugated, but they're functionally able to bind to the target uh, of interest in general. And so we put this to work then to say, can we go find molecules that are selectively able to bind to one particular carbonic anhydrase isoform in an active uh, way, in an antagonistic way? So we make a combinatorial library of, of proteins via the same approach described in the earlier work but now conjugate those with the small molecule to make these hybrids or prisms. Sort for two different types of things. Sort for affinity uh, by doing flow cytometry to find the particular variants that have the best binding per fibronectin um, available for binding, as well as the most specific binding, things that bind to CA2, but don't bind to CA9. 
and to summarize an awful lot of hard work uh, um, by Andrew uh, and Abby in this case, it works. And we're able to, um, if we tried to do this towards CA2, as shown here, we could find molecules that bind much more strongly to CA2 than CA9 and show potent binding the ability to bind at these low concentrations. We can also characterize that even more vigorously if we go ahead and produce these molecules uh, in E. coli, purify them, conjugate them, validate them via mass spec. We can then compare the, the existing study in small molecules, so that's acetazolamide or AAZ, shown here in these dashed lines, has very similar activity against uh, CA2 and CA9. So CA2 is here in blue, sorry for the lack of a label, CA9 is in orange. And so the study in small molecule has a very slight preference for CA2, um, but upon doing the engineering to conjugate to a particular fibronectin domain, uh, we drive stronger potency towards CA2 and weaker potency against CA9. So it's both more potent and more selective than the studying small molecule was. So then ask the question, how generalizable is this? Um, how much of is it a function of the protein sequence of the linker that we happen to use and things of that type? And so we then iterated this concept on uh, different lengths. And so here's again that studying small molecule with a very mild preference for CA2. And then here's the engineered version that I just showed. But we then compared that with a, a host of different linker lengths and found that we can iterate the same idea um, with this was a PEG7 linker in this uh, linker region here. If we shorten that linker, we can still get this to work. If we shorten it more, it can still work. But we can see in these particular cases, we still get specificity, but the potency of inhibition is, is going down. And in the particular example, where we shortened it all the way to PEG2, that particular molecule did not show specificity. But then when we generalize this idea to say, could we conjugate somewhere else on the protein? So the initial data I was showing was conjugated at this particular site on the protein. What happens if we conjugate somewhere else? It still works. Uh, so now we conjugate at site 80 in the fibronectin protein. We again see nice specificity. And so for example, even with the short linker shown here, we still are able to get specificity. So this is an anecdotal case of it not working in general. Uh, multiple different linker links work. And now we can see multiple conjugation sites work as well. In addition, we can flip uh, the aim. And instead of trying to make things CA2 specific, we can make things CA9 specific instead. And indeed, we find nice specificity uh, towards the CA9 isoform instead of the CA2 isoform in these cases. In some cases, in many cases, maintaining the potency of the initial small molecule, in some cases, even improving upon that. But in nearly all cases, definitely improving upon the specificity. So we also asked the question about um, tuning the linker length after the fact. So in this case, we go find a binder, we lock in that particular sequence, and then say, what happens if we change that particular linker length? So we start with this particular binder that worked well with the short linker. And as we lengthen that linker, it changes that interface that we have of the protein small molecule hybrid for that carbonic anhydrase. And so it gets a little bit less specific and a little bit less potent as we lengthen the linker from two to three pegs. If we lengthen it more, um, it becomes a little bit less potent still and even less specific. And if we lengthen it even further, we get some specificity back because it basically stops binding the CA9 altogether, but we continue to hinder that uh, affinity. So the idea of having the right linker length in the stage of discovery indeed is quite important. Same idea, but here we started with a longer linker and more or less the same thing happened that as we modified the linker length from the starting point uh, to a different linker length, it, it hurt performance in general. And then we did this at a library scale where we screened for many, many thousands of, of hits and in the context of a PEG2, a PEG3, et cetera, and found that some particular protein sequences were actually broadly tolerant and we were able, for example, this green line here, that particular clone was functional at any of the lengths, a little bit more functional with mid lengths, but it was still functional at two and seven. This particular clone highlighted in orange here worked at all particular lengths, but was most functional uh, with the longer length. This clone in red was only functional at peg seven and went all the way down to zero functionality, other lengths, and so on and so forth. Summary statement being the linker length is an important element of these protein small molecule conjugates. More broadly, these protein small molecule conjugates can be engineered for specific potency. So it's the combination of specificity towards the isoform of interest, but also not just binding, but actually having potency towards the target of interest. And so this is a compelling avenue to go forward um, uh, to be able to hit select epitopes and or have particular modes of biologic, biological uh, activity. I'm just gonna check how I'm doing on time here. Very good, okay. So one other element though, in terms of putting this um, high throughput discovery direct evolution platform to work in terms of a target perspective, is that in some cases, their recombinant molecules don't properly mimic um, the genuine targets that we have in mind, right? So these prisms or protein small molecule conjugates can help us hit the particular location and particular activity we want. 
but we were still in that case using your recombinant carbonic anhydrase as a target of interest. And in that case, it, it did its job well. But in some cases, these targets will not properly mimic the genuine cellular target. So for example, in the case of epidermal growth factor receptor highlighted here, the idea is we want to make things that bind to genuine EGFR as it exists on top, uh, on the surface, on the, uh, on the membrane, excuse me, of a tumor cell. But how we actually typically work with that in the lab is to make a recombinant version of this ectodomain. So we'll make the ectodomain of EGFR recombinantly, uh, use it as the target, of it, whether it be fluorescent-based back sorting or make that a bead or what have you. But in some cases, improper glycosylation, folding, ligamentization, um, the, the absence of membrane sterics um, get in the way. And this recombinant molecule does not behave as the genuine uh, cellular molecule would. Or in other cases, we might not even know what the target is. We might have tissue and we want to make select binders to that tissue. Um, and so for many different reasons, um, to transfer the idea from soluble or recombinant molecule target to fully cellular intact target is compelling. And Eric Schuster's group at the University of Wisconsin has really pioneered work in this space saying, let's use fully intact uh, cells as the target of interest. And people since then have expanded the idea of using whole tissues as well, or even in some cases doing uh, animal model in vivo, in vivo based um, phage display as well. And so this concept works in that you can use intact cells, but it remains challenging in certain circumstances. And so uh, Larry Stern and Patrick Lown in the group have, have led the charge to try to see if we can improve this. So a few of the challenges have been uh, penning is hindered by modest affinity and valency. So the setup here is to go back to yeast surface displays. So we have a yeast surface displayed library of different potential candidate ligands. We take uh, cell lines in T75 flasks or, or petri dishes or six fold plates or different formats of that, but basically adherent uh, cell monolayers uh, and take that yeast library, put it on top of the cells, uh, give them time to incubate and the binders to bind and then wash away the non-binders. And again, conceptually this works, but in practice it's limited by you get much better enrichment of genuine binders relative to non-binders if you have a higher affinity relative to a lower affinity. So with these low affinity binders, molecules, the approach does not work too well. In addition, you get much better enrichment here if you have a very high expressing cell line than a more mid expressing uh, cell line. And this has been shown not just in this particular model system of EGFR based ligand, uh, but also um, targeting different epitopes on the EGFR and using not only the fibronectin domain, which is what this data is here, but using alpha bodies and GP2 scaffolds as well. So in general, the affinity and valency of these pain techniques matter. And so if you have a particular target, for example, that is not present at a million copies per cell, which many important oncology targets are simply not present at that level, this approach can be, can be more challenging. But what we found is that it was an accessibility issue. Uh, and so if you extend the length of the, uh, of the linker between the yeast cell here and the yeast mating protein that tethers the ligand to the surface, by having a longer polypeptide linker, we can now actually see improved performance, especially at these more challenging conditions of moderate affinity and moderate expression level. And since uh, this particular work, we've also further extended that linker to be even longer and seen even further boosts uh, in that as well. And that paper is also recently published. So we put this idea together to say, okay, in some cases we're able to get rid of these recombinant targets. In other cases, we need to do direct panning on fully intact cells. How do these different approaches compare to each other? And can we apply this towards making genuine binders towards uh, an important uh, cancer target, that one being uh, the neovasculature target B7H3 or CD276. Um, so what we did is five different campaigns. We took a recombinant based target and sorted it on magnetic based magnetic beads, followed by flow cytometry, either with again a recombinant target or using cellular lysate, uh, or following the recombinant based approach with a cell panning based approach. Or we did just cell panning the entire way, uh, either by just direct enrichment or enrichment, but then depletion against um, cell types that don't have the target of interest. Uh, and long story short, with excellent work by Larry and Patrick on this, we found that we get more genuine specific binders using these cell panning based approaches. The two challenges we see are that we get a lot of non-genuine binders here. We get binders in all the different campaigns, but a lot of those binders don't bind genuine cellular target uh, if we're using these recombinant based approaches whereas we do get more that binds on you and target in these cases. The challenge we get in these based approaches is we also get things that bind to those cells, but not to those particular targets. And so working on approaches now to, to drive even greater specificity in these cell panning based um, approaches. 
But again, we applied this towards a particular target, B7H3 or CD276, which is an important cancer biomarker, particularly of the neovasculature. So this was collaborative work with uh, Stanford's radiology department and that they were interested in being able to uh, diagnose tumors at an early stage based on neovasculature. And, and they identified B7H3 uh, based on uh, IHC and other approaches from, from patient tissue samples. And so given that particular motivated target, um, we put that approach to work, uh, to work and we found alpha bodies that bind to B7H3 quite selectively uh, in collaboration then with Jürgen Willman's group and Kash Bam's group at Stanford we conjugated those to these micron-sized perfluorobutane cord microbubbles, essentially just a phospholipid shell of perfluorobutane core, which acts as a very nice contrast agent for um, molecular ultrasound. And so here we go. And so if you then take that agent and administer it uh, into the animal and then perform ultrasound, and then not only do you perform an ultrasound, but then you also add a brief destructive pulse. And so of all the bubbles that were in the spot, the ones that were localized because of binding to B7H3, as well as the ones flowing through in the bloodstream, will all be destroyed by that local destructive pulse. But then a moment later, you'll have fresh bubbles floating past. So the difference between the before and after the destructive pulse will tell you how many of them were actually bound uh, locally to the vasculature. And as a result, you can see very strong signal in uh, the breast cancer model and this marine model, whereas the healthy tissue has much, much lower signal. And so this has been used preclinically uh, and is being pushed forward now in other formats uh, clinically as well uh, to be able to image uh, the neovasculature and in particular CD276 of that vasculature. We've also uh, taken an imaging-based approach where instead of the perfluorobutane micro bubble, we add a photoacoustic contrast agent, uh, endocyanine green here, and perform molecular photoacoustic imaging. Uh, this work with Captain Wilson's group at, at Stanford as well, showing a second modality of the same concept. So same idea, targeting B7H3, CD276, either conjugating it to a micro bubble or to a photoacoustic contrast agent, we can image the uh, localization of that particular cancer biomarker. Okay, and so we've highlighted the ability here to efficiently find ligands, two different approaches for how we can make that ligand hit the desired uh, target uh, and have the desired activity. But in many cases, there's still one more challenge when it comes to evolving biologics, be they be for diagnostics or therapeutics. And that's generally termed developability. So this combination of physical robustness for expressing these commonly to be made as agents, keeping them stable, keeping them soluble, actually has hindered a whole host of different uh, molecules in the pipeline uh, over the years. And so the, pharma the pharmaceutical industry really has a, a strong appreciation um, um, for this challenge because of so many campaigns that have been have hindered or fully stopped because of limited developability of their lead agents. And so multiple very nice papers have, have emerged from, from the literature over, over the last few years in this space. Um, perhaps the best being this um, PNAS paper um, by the team at Atomab. Um, highlighting the different biophysical liabilities of antibodies. They took the 150 or so um, clinical stage antibodies at the time, produced them all in-house, and then put them through a whole series of different biophysical assays uh, to see of the molecules that have been fully approved versus the ones that did not or have not yet been. Are there differences in terms of uh, biophysical metrics that would predict their ultimate uh, success or lack of success as they work their way through development? And that highlighted that indeed there are numerous assays that can be done uh, to help to differentiate functional and developable molecules that are functional but ultimately not practically useful because of limited developability. And so that was a very useful uh, thing for the field. A challenge though being those are still fairly laborious techniques to do to highlight which particular molecules might have poor expression, conformational instability, lack of solubility or bind multiple different targets. How could we do that, but more efficiently? So our approach was to ask the question, are there strategies we could use to discover or design developability as part of the um, discovery process? And so we don't go find a lead molecule only to find out, oh, it's not going to be developable. Can we build it in? So I highlight here again, we're not the only people working in this space. There's been some very nice work um, from computational and experimental based approaches to try to predict what particular um, elements of a protein will make it developable or not developable. Uh, for example, looking at um, computational models of stability or aggregation, for example, using medium throughput based screening approaches to see what proteins aggregate and things of that type. But our question was, could we build upon this even more broadly uh, and have library scale evaluation of uh, developability so that we could either 
integrate that into the screening process. So we screen for binding and developability at the same time. And or could we actually understand the sequence elements that dictate developability so that we could design it into the library uh, from the outset? So really two modes uh, in mind, discovery mode and design mode as well. And so Alex Skalinski has led this work uh, in the lab. We did this with the GP2 ligand scaffold that I mentioned before uh, because of its compelling ad advantages. One of its limitations though, it, has is quite, it does have variable developability. For example, its expression level in E. coli in some clones is excellent and other lead molecules is, is really quite poor. And so we had motivation to try to make this a more developable and robust molecule. We had found uh, that there's a disulfide bond that often emerges upon the evolutionary process to help stabilize the protein here. So that's something that we kept in mind as we pushed forward on this. And so Alex ultimately found in evaluating a host of different potential library scale assays where these three particular ones that I'm gonna highlight here were most effective. So this is a yeast display-based protease assay. So we display the protein of interest, in this case, GP2, on the surface of a yeast cell, same way we described it for binder discovery before. Then we expose that uh, library of yeast to protease. Very stable um, GP2s will remain fully intact because their foldedness prevents them from being chewed up by the protease. But relatively unstable GP2s will have local conformational unfolding and the protease can then chew it up. And so if we label these two epitopes, CMIC and HA respectively with antibodies and perform flow cytometry, the stable molecules will have a lot of CMIC signals still left behind, whereas the unstable molecules will be down here uh, in the absence of that. And so we can take a full library of millions of different GP2 variants and sort them into bins on high stability, medium stability, and low stability, and then do deep sequencing to find out what are the sequences that drive that performance. The second assay is the split GFP uh, assay shown here. So we take the protein of interest fused to one strand of GFP, and then the remainder of GFP strands one through 10 and co-express them in E. coli. If this protein is expressed well and remains soluble and stable, we can then uh, recombine GFP one through 10 with GFP 11 to make fully intact GFP non-covalently, but sufficiently to provide fluorescence. If instead we don't get expression of that GP2 variant, we can't recombine and get fluorescence. And so we can then select cells that are fluorescent from those that are not, uh, and again, stratify clones on the basis of deep sequencing after cell cytometry to find out which ones are functional and not functional. And lastly, the split beta lactamase. Here, what we do is uh, take two halves of, or two portions, I should say, not literally halves of, of, of beta lactamase and combine them to either end of, of GP2. If there's a, a well-folded stable GP2, we'll be able to have those two portions of the lactamase recombine inside of the E. coli cell. And with that lactamase functionality present, they can withstand ampicillin in their growth media. If we don't have expression stability and solubility, we won't have a functional lactamase and those cells will die in the presence of ampicillin. And so we grow a population, again, a library of many different GP2 variants, and then sort out the ones um, that Multi that grow uh, and therefore uh, amplify themselves. And so we deep sequence at different concentrations of ampicillin. And from the presence or absence of particular sequences, uh, we can calculate out the infer out the growth rate for those particular clones. And so we're evaluating protease resistance, uh, stable soluble expression in one format and stable soluble expression in a different format. Um, and the question is, does it actually work? So these are a set of assays and do they actually proxy for developability? Uh, and so for the sake of time, I'm going to jump over some of the details, but happy to answer it in, in the question and answer or, or just offline of, of how we did this modeling. We took a whole host of different uh, algorithms, ridge regression, uh, random forest models, support vector machines, or neural networks, and evaluated if we take different combinations of these assays that I just mentioned, both in terms of the just explicit experimental score and the particular protein sequence for the GP2 variant, uh, and use them to, to train uh, how effectively does this actually yield developability? And our metric here to, for developability, was there a combinant yield or soluble expression in, in E. coli? The summary statement is that, is, is that it works. All of the assay conditions of the various different assays that we tried, uh, including several I didn't highlight here, uh, did provide some utility over the control, uh, which was no information. So all the different 1,023 different combinations of many assays that we tried, all of them performed better than the negative control here. And many of them perform better than uh, simply a sequence-based model. But in particular, the three that I highlighted, uh, highlighted for a reason, because those were the three most functional. The yeast display protease-based assay at body temperature, 
and split GFP and split lactamase, both in a particular uh, strain of E. coli called shuffle cells, were the most performant. And collectively, they predicted developability much more effectively uh, than controls did, and that's highlighted uh, here. And so we find a 35% improvement in terms of design relative uh, to sequence-based models alone. And so this enables us now to design better uh, library and or just direct mutations. And so this is now a heat map of looking at different sites in the GP2 protein, which amino acids or physical chemical types of amino acids are most effective. So for example, in this center, uh, this center, excuse me, of the loop of GP2, we find that polar amino acids are favored in developable molecules. In this location of the GP2 protein, we want to avoid uh, prolines, despite the fact that it needs to make this turn in the protein, but instead you use glycine molecules. So it needs flexibility to make that turn, but it does not want rigidness in terms of a proline to, to make that turn, for example, and a host of other things I learned as well. I'm just highlighting a few of the elements. So this again, guides us towards improved combinatorial library design. In addition, we can ask the question in terms of predictability. So this is cross-validation test loss, essentially. Uh, so this is the inverse of accuracy. So we get more and more accurate in terms of our model, the more that we train it with different sequences. Um, but we can see here that we require a lot of different sequences to train this model uh, effectively. Um, but the high throughput assays that we found enable that to, to be realized. And so we see much, much more efficient training using these high throughput assays than if we were simply evaluating sequence alone. And I should highlight that this um, machine learning and other uh, data science analytics were done in collaboration with Stefano Martignani in, in our department as well. And lastly, on this particular topic, um, we asked the question, can we avoid the assays altogether uh, in the long run and directly map the landscape? So if we have a particular, the question is, can we take a particular protein sequence and predict whether or not it will ultimately be developable, have a higher recombinant yield? So can we use this developability representation as what's considered a latent space model uh, to go straight from sequence to that understanding. What we're gonna do is train this particular representation by using those assays as an intermediary. Can we go from sequence to predict the performance of the assay and have the assay performance predict the model yield? And once we understand the right representation for that machine learning, can we then just skip this arm altogether and go straight from sequence to model? The summary there is that it's still in progress, but early returns suggest that indeed this is going to be functional, that if we take different types of embeddings or encodings for this representation, so one, the simplest version would just direct sequence. Every particular amino acid uh, is its own element at every site of that is simply, is the first site an A or not? Is the second site a W or not? And so on and so forth. That's the direct, what we call one hot encoding. Or you can give particular amino acids, particular properties and use that to embed or you can get more involved with recurrent or convolutional neural networks to think of them from a language modeling perspective or an image modeling perspective, which of these different versions works well. Ultimately, what we found is this convolutional neural network is indeed very, very functional in being able to get from sequence directly to the outcome much more uh, effectively than other approaches. I'll skip over that part. And so in summary, from a developability perspective, this trio of high throughput assays does indeed empower developability design so that as we're trying to make functional oncology targeting agents for therapeutics and diagnostics, we can make sure that they're actually going to be useful in terms of being biophysically robust uh, and useful. And we can get there with this developability representation based approach. And we're now working on this, generalizing this to more protein families and more metrics of developability as well. Okay. Good on time. And so collectively, I wanted to highlight different advances that we've been working on in this space of engineering ligands as uh, targeted agents for therapeutics and diagnostics. And what we found is that if we design the particular scaffold from a biophysical perspective and the site-wise diversity that we put into that scaffold, we can be more efficient in finding those molecules. If we um, make protein small molecule fusions, and or use cell panning. Both of those approaches can help us find particular genuine function, either by targeting the epitope in an active way and or making sure that the epitope is a genuine representation of itself. That can benefit us from a ligand discovery perspective. To make sure that the molecule is useful, um, we can perform developability screening and or design using this DevRep-based approach I just mentioned. And if we put all those things together, we can indeed find more functional proteins and use them for, for example, molecular ultrasound, uh, PET, or the host of different uh, therapeutic-based leads that I've highlighted along the way as well. 
Thank you for your attention. Most importantly, again, want to thank uh, the wonderful students and postdocs and collaborators who did the work. Tried to mention them uh, along the way. Apologize for those that I uh, that I failed to mention as I was diving into the science. And also want to thank uh, our various uh, supports along the way. A lot of the work I highlighted here was supported by the National Institutes of Health, as well as the American Cancer Society uh, and various outlets here uh, at the university. So thanks so much for your attention. Happy to take questions if I've left myself any time. Okay, do we uh, take questions in the chat? Yeah, people can either um, write their answer or their questions in the Q&A module, or if they um, select raise hand, we can unmute them so they can ask the question. Okay. Sorry, I was I had my mute on, I'm back. Looks ben, like uh, ben, Kristen I'll... Wagner has a question. Oops. I will. Ed, Rick. Hang on, I got you. Okay. I just unmuted him. Okay. He's muted again. All right. It's not allowing me to. I can ask him to unmute. Good. Carson, You're good, Rick. Can, All right. Can you talk? Okay. okay. Yep. Sorry um, for that. Yep. <clears throat> Ben, really nice. <clears throat> um, Thanks. Um, in your scaffold, uh, in I, I didn't quite understand on your EGFR, the one you had earlier, where you had the selectivity over um, high, uh, high expression over low expression. Yeah. Exactly what your how you get the the selectivity. The reason being is, of course, if you have a high affinity binder it should bind to the ligand right on the surface of the cell. Um, and you'd expect it to bind to either low expressors or high expressors. Um, and so there's not an avidity effect you're taking advantage of there because it's a single binder. Uh, and so is it just that the signal, the amount of the signal is lower than, you know, when you have lower amounts bound relative to, um, the you know the one where you have just high you know you have high expression of EGFR on the surface. Yeah, great question. And um, the last part, your hypothesis was indeed correct. So in this particular case, we're not taking advantage of any multivalency based avidity effects, which of course your group has done great work on. Um, here we're just simply making a molecule that has uh, medium to high affinity. Uh, I forget the exact affinity here. I think it's about ten nanomolar for these particular binders. Uh, when you put them in the radiochemical form. And so what we're simply seeing here is that these particular tumors here in this flank uh, have such a low EGFR expression level that uh, we don't see appreciable signal. Whereas there's millions of EGFR per cell on these particular tumors and we much, see a much higher expression. Indeed, adding on top of this, um, you know, avidity-based effects where you had a pair of weak affinity molecules, for example, would uh, likely, and you've seen in other model systems, boost that up uh, even further still. In this particular example, it's a single monovalent agent that is able to differentiate strictly on the fact that because of its relatively high affinity, it's very sensitive. And so it can sensitively pick up this high expression whereas there's simply just not enough bound ligand here to see. Um, okay. Um, and, um... On the stability work, uh, that stability work was really pretty impressive. Um, do you, do you um, it, when you look at your new scaffold, uh, picking a new scaffold, can you do, uh, uh, can you now kind of apply these principles to a new scaffold right off the bat? Uh, to see yeah, that's, if, a, um, that's a great question. We're exactly in the middle of that right now. So we have, I, I didn't show this here, but we have, um, quite a few, multiple, multiple scaffolds that we're now putting through this developability analysis, both the existing ones, so the fibronectins and the alpha bodies that I alluded to in some of our other work here today, but also a whole host of different synthetic scaffolds that uh, Gabe Rocklin at, um, at the time using Dave Baker's group at Washington, now he's got his own lab at Northwestern. He's designed these different synthetic scaffolds. We're taking both these existing ones and these new synthetic ones and putting them through this developability analysis to see which ones are robust and the ones that are moderately robust, how can we make them more developable and robust? Um, 
And so it's, we're still in the middle of that. So it's, I think, too early to say what the conclusion is, but the early suggestions of the data would indicate that this, this approach of, of high throughput assay of analysis followed by the feedback loop of deep sequencing uh, is, is likely to yield, to yield benefit to make these molecules any one existing scaffold more robust, but also to then prune out the ones that aren't going to be robust and just stop working with them. Nice work. We're still waiting on it. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. You're welcome. There's a question here in the Q&A. Have you considered the immunogenicity of your modified molecules and potential self antibodies against the natural human version if it was produced from what was originally a human protein? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I guess the answer is, have we considered it? Absolutely. Have we solved it? Not at all. Um, and so it remains, you know, a, a very clear and open challenge with any protein engineering work is to ask that immunogenicity question. Our perspective on this is, I guess, multiple fold. The one is we're open to all insight. So anyone who's, who's got insight that could help us think about this earlier in the development stage, we're, we're happy to listen to it and happy to work on it uh, collaboratively. Um, our take for now um, would be that uh, to think about it, to make sure we think about it as we move forward with translation, but with optimism that the smaller and more stable it is, um, we're hopeful that the pharmacokinetic and stability combination will help these to avoid immune response or at least reduce immune response. That's that's optimism. That's not that's not hard data. We have put, for example, this EGFR GP2 molecule on the on the current screen uh, into mouse models and saw very limited uh, antibody response. But of course, that's a mouse model of antibody response, not a human patient, and so only time will tell them that in that realm. So. Our, our hope is that by making them very, very robust, that will help reduce uh, breakdown, help having them be uh, quickly cleared could also help along the way, but we won't know until we do more advanced studies and, and we're always eager to hear suggestions on what we could think about there. Thanks for the question. All right, great. Does anyone else have any questions? I, I do. Ben, so, hi, Ben. Uh, hey, Ben. Thinking about, you know, uh, the fibronectin where you uh, put the small molecule off the cysteine, what a, how, maybe you could just comment on the um, uh, difficulty, or I assume it's difficult, to put a non-canonical amino acid so you could use, you know, these so-called, you know, ortho bioorthogonal chemistry like click chemistry or tetrazines or all that stuff that, because um, then you could do maybe multi, a multi display of two different molecules. So um, I'm just I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so our thoughts on that, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, I'm, I'm very um, enthusiastic about the nanoconicals directly as well. And ultimately would like to do some of that in, in, in my lab as well. For now, we just haven't yet. Uh, we're actually collaborating with Jim uh, Van Deventer's group at Tufts on trying to merge those concepts a bit. Um, and they've done some really nice work in that space and, and so has Dave Trail and others. But anyway, our, our thought here is, can we expand upon that concept just again from a, from a chemical based approach for now. So I'm absolutely as enthusiastic about the non-chemical based approach as I am about this. I think this is just one more tool in that in that toolkit, so to speak. Um, so that's a broad answer. You asked a more specific answer about the thiols, et cetera. Um, do I think we could, you know, for example, do this, but with non-canonicals as an alternative chemistry? Yes. And, and we're working on that right now collaboratively. That's great. Thank you. Did I hit all your questions? Yeah, There's for sure. Multiple elements there and I'm not sure I got them. Okay. No, you got it. Thank you. Great. All right, do we have any more questions for Ben? There's one in the Q&A. Um, another oh, one? Is there another one I missed? Is that the one that I got oh, already? Yeah, oh, yeah, we got right. yep, no, Mark's got one. Have you applied your approach to a ligand that only binds its receptor as a multimer and converted to a ligand that will bind as a monomer? Have you applied? Hmm. No, it's the short answer. Um, but I'm trying to think of, do you have a particular case in mind? Um, I'm just trying to think of, ah, I see. No, we have not pursued that. I'd be, I'd be very happy to discuss that more, Mark, um, about ways that we could come to a realization on that. Um, yeah, and the thing where I, my, my, my first thought is we should definitely be able to design a strategy to make that effective, um, but the, the challenge is always in the details, so uh, I'm happy to chat about it. All right. Um, we'll go back to Rick Wagner. Rick, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hey, hey, Ben. 
uh, as a follow-up to Dan's question, a little bit different perspective. You know, when you have this uh, prism engineering, <clears throat> um, if you have you thought of using that as a screen, in other words, incorporating uh, a diversity of molecules there, or, or just one or two molecules, while diversifying the, you know, the protein scaffold for a, a surface protein, you know, a surface target. In other words, incorporating that as part of the binding element. Um, and then um, using the small molecule as a way of turning that binding off, you know, as a competition. In other words, that you'd be able to um, have it bind tightly with the conjugate. But then if you threw in the uh, small molecule, it'd be able to, you know, um, uh, allow it to, dis to, to to compete and therefore disassemble it from it. And therefore you'd have a switch um, between the two. So to clarify, you're saying to engineer a prism in the hybrid conjugated form, and that would be the administered agent, but then you could also dose the patient with small molecule alone as basically- To turn it off. So that, right, well, no, the other way around. In other words, when you want to turn the binding off, in other words, uh, to compete for- Ah, no, so the prism is the inactivator. Right, right. And then you want to, and then if you, you know, you can pick your poison in terms of the small molecule, you could pick an FDA approved drug actually, that would be even better, you know, as the part of the diversity element um, that's engineered in and, and allow the allow the diversification to find what's the best way of using it. Yes. And then and then allow you to, because one of the things that's an issue is can you turn off binding too? Because you can have um, biological processes that get out of control like a, a cytokine storm activation stuff. And that would allow you to basically serve as an antidote to, to stop it from binding. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so if I understand correctly, and, and my apologies if I don't, can you basically pick an existing known pharmacophore and build a prism to be its antagonist? And so I think what you, so my, we have not done that is the, is the short answer, but I would expect it to work in so far as you could screen for antagonism of that small molecule itself with the idea being you might be able to get away with the exact same pharmacophore just attached to the protein in such a way that it renders it inactive instead of active, or you might end up, you know, needing to do some, some chemistry on that small molecule as well, where the analog will be sufficient to guide it toward that, towards that same active site, but the combination of the modified pharmacophore with the benefit of the protein would be, would give you that modified activity and switch it from being an agonist to an antagonist. I certainly expect that that would work. We have not done anything to, to implement that literally yet, but I, I suspect that that would work. I, I can talk to you later. Thanks. Great. Okay, good. I don't see any more questions in our Q&A. Does anyone else have a hand to raise? All right, otherwise I think we'd just like to say thank you so much to Ben Heckel for a great seminar. And we encourage you to reach out to him if you have any more questions. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Good. Really Thanks. nice, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. You know, I was thinking about uh, 